Uh, good evening and welcome to another edition of the Socrates Project. I'm Claudia Emerson and I am the director of the Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation here at McMaster University and I will be your moderator tonight. Our topic this evening is on research ethics in the time of COVID-19 and it's a topic that we've been following very closely here at the Institute where our work is focused on um, global health uh, research and the ethics thereof. We work very closely with uh, stakeholders in, in global health, uh, sponsors, uh, funders, uh, government, uh, industry, academia, and international bodies such as the World Health Organization to identify, understand, and ideally address uh, many of the issues that we encounter in the global health research space. And the ethics issues are indeed uh, very complex. Our focus is on the innovation pathway, so taking interventions for the public good, such as new diagnostics, uh, vaccines, drugs, through from research discovery, through development, through delivery, and ultimately through adoption. And so uh, the involvement of human subjects and communities uh, in the research obviously raises many concerns. And these are often complicated by a diversity of values, of sociocultural, um, opinions, political backdrop, and indeed the disparity between um, the global north and the global south with respect to health, resources, and, um, and power. And so um, these uh, issues are often uh, very complex and nuanced in ordinary research times. And so you can imagine that in the time of an epidemic or public health emergency response, they become much more pronounced and much more complex. And indeed, there may even be new issues. So I'm very pleased tonight uh, to have a panel, an expert panel of excellent guests who will help um, us navigate uh, all of the myriad of issues that come up in, in, during the context of the pandemic. And it will help us sort of untangle uh, what those issues might be. I'm going to uh, introduce them all. And then um, Dr. Matt Grillet will give a short presentation to introduce us to the topic. I will then... Um, reach out to the panelists for commentary and discussion and then open it up uh, to the audience uh, for questions and so I invite you please put your questions in the Q&A functions. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Matt Grillet. Uh, he is my faculty colleague here at the Institute. Dr. Grillet is a philosopher of law and a bioethicist and he leads our portfolio on the ethics of emerging technology. Thanks very much Matt and welcome. Next, we have Dr. Jennifer Maroa, who is an advisor for scientific programs for the African Academy of Sciences and also an assistant clinical professor at the University of Washington. And Jennifer's work involves the strengthening of research and development capacity in Africa. And she has a long career in um, HIV research, uh, clinical research, and, and database. Uh, so welcome, Jennifer, and thank you very much for joining us today from Seattle. Our next speaker is Professor Seema Shah, and Professor Shah is a lawyer and bioethicist. Uh, she is currently the founding board's professor of medical ethics at Northwestern University Medical School, and also the associate director of the bioethics program at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Professor Shah is a leading scholar in the ethics of human challenge studies. She served as the panel chair for the Zika uh, panel uh, back when that outbreak was going on for the NIH. She recently uh, served as a working group member for the World Health Organization Human Challenge uh, Group that issued guidance recently on human challenge studies for COVID-19, and also the lead author of a publication in the journal Science just two weeks ago on ethics uh, related to human challenge studies. Thanks very much, Seema, for joining us and welcome. And lastly, we have Dr. Russ Upshur. Dr. Upshur is a physician, an epidemiologist, a philosopher of medicine and science, a bioethicist. Um, Dr. Upshur has far too many positions for me to recount here. Um, however, currently he is the head of the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dalalana School of Public Health in uh, the University of Toronto. I think probably uh, one way to capture the depth and breadth of uh, Dr. Upshur's knowledge and expertise is to say that he is a public health emergency veteran extraordinaire, 
having been involved in all of the most recent outbreaks, SARS, pandemic flu, Ebola, Zika, and now COVID-19, through his research, his work uh, with the World Health Organization, at Sense of Frontier, and much, much more. Thanks very much, Ross, for joining us tonight and welcome. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the floor now to uh, Dr. Grillette. Matt, please have the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here. I'm going to start us off with a short introduction that involves a bit of a PowerPoint presentation. So excuse me as I just kind of bring up these slides. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. So to help us get situated, I'd like to start by getting us thinking about the importance of biomedical research within any epidemic setting. Uh, as I'm sure you've heard, COVID-19 is now being called a once in a century outbreak. And at this point, that claim doesn't seem to be much of an exaggeration. Uh, but the current pandemic is far from the first outbreak that we've experienced uh, even in the last 60 years. Uh, rather, the global community has seen outbreaks such as SARS, MERS, H1N1, HIV, and of course Ebola, as well as out in, excuse me, uh, outbreaks of influenza in 1957 and 1968, and even sporadic outbreaks of cholera uh, that have killed millions. The result is that over the last two decades, nation states and international organizations have been busy, very busy, developing and reworking guidelines meant to help us prepare uh, for an emerging epidemic or pandemic. And central to these documents is the expectation that states would both preemptively invest in research infrastructure and that they will commit to both supporting and being guided by the results of ongoing biomedical research during an outbreak. In particular, Excuse me here, there we go, Oop. sorry guys, there we are. In particular, these sorts of documents that you see here place an emphasis on the need to develop and deploy epidemiological models and studies. Studies that will allow us to identify the pathways through which a virus is spreading, as well as help us getting a handle on its current location, speed, and trajectory. These documents also emphasize the need for investment in and coordination between a host of other fields of research, uh, such as virology, genomics, immunology, all of whose work will hopefully provide for the creation of preventative or therapeutic clinical interventions. So we know, and we've all recently been witness to, the ways in which biomedical research is essential to dealing with the uncertainty that's inherent to a pandemic, uh, as well as how it allows us to hopefully create clinical solutions to these sorts of catastrophes. But most of us also know that we have to be careful with the way that such research is pursued. Medical research can achieve immense amounts of good in the world, saving tens or hundreds of millions of lives, as we've seen with the development of vaccines such as polio and, excuse me, such as polio. Um, but it can also bring about horrible results when it's employed in a rushed, short-sighted, or willfully ignorant fashion. Indeed, it's precisely the fact that research can function as a kind of double-edged blade that scholars, officials, and even researchers themselves have supported the development of a discipline that we now know as research ethics. Now, to be clear, the idea behind research ethics is simply this. Yes, we want to make sure that we're pursuing research in a way that is as efficient and as efficacious as possible. But we also want to make sure that we do so in a way that looks out for and tries to balance the rights and interests of all the persons and institutions that are invested in that research as well as all the people who might be affected by it. And so the thought is, we should move beyond purely scientific reasoning to also employ moral considerations when thinking about how to pursue our projects of research. Now, under normal circumstances, research ethics tends to be focused on a certain constellation of ethical issues or biomedical concerns. There's obviously not enough time for us to canvas all of these here today, but I'd like to give you a little representative sample. So in the everyday, again, research ethicists tend to deal with a lot of puzzles involving research participants. There we go. This includes questions about how much risk it's acceptable to subject a research subject to. For example, is it ever appropriate to subject a person to research that might put them at a risk of permanent injury? But when thinking about participants, we might also consider issues of consent. For example, if a research subject has blood or tissue samples taken, do they have any right to control where those samples go, the right to get them back? 
At the same time, standard research ethics also deals with questions of how researchers ought to behave. For example, do researchers at different institutions have an obligation to collaborate with each other? Right? And what if doing so will dramatically increase scientific efficacy? Similarly, there's questions about when and how researchers should release the results of their work. So for example, can there ever be situations where it's appropriate for a study's results to be suppressed or hidden from public view? On a third and different front, there's a lot of serious questions having to do with the rights that a community might have with regards to research projects that happen within it. For example, should people have a final say over what types of research goes on in their communities? And if research is being pursued in a community, should its members have special access to research discoveries? And when it comes to understanding and resolving these everyday sorts of research ethics issues and many others like them, research ethicists rely on a tried and true set of ethical, ethical concepts and principles. So for example, if you've ever seen a set of research ethics guidelines or submitted your work for review, then you'll have seen a lot of concepts such as transparency, consent, engagement, trust building, communication, and even risk minimization. And at the same time, you'll see that there's an expectation that one acts in line with certain moral values such as autonomy, dignity, and fairness. And for a very quick example of how these sorts of ethical concepts and tools are used to shape practices of research, just consider the following. When it comes to thinking about what sorts of protections research participants should have, one widely accepted answer plays on the values of autonomy and the concept of consent. And it goes as follows. If we think that people's autonomy should be respected, then surely this means we should give them the final say over whether to participate in activities that could significantly affect their well-being. But if this is true, then it would be wrong to trick or force someone into participating in a research project. Thus, we should structure our research protocols so that researchers must receive the free and informed consent of every research participant enrolled in their studies. Not because this will necessarily make the science any more efficient or accurate, but because it's the right thing to do. All right, so at this point, we've talked about the importance of research in a time of pandemics. And we've also talked about the nature of everyday research ethics, right? ethics as it's normally pursued. What we're going to do now is take a few minutes to discuss how these two things combine. That is, we're going to talk about how pandemics, like the one we're currently undergoing, put some of our most basic ethical commitments to the test, and also how they serve to underscore the importance of less well-known ethical issues. With this in mind, let's talk for a minute about the nature of the current pandemic. As we now all know far too well, since January, COVID has spread to just about every corner of the world and every country on earth, having been detected in nearly 5 million people and causing more than 300,000 deaths. And as of today, we've been unable to develop an effective clinical prevention or even a treatment for this disease. And instead, we have to rely on the use of physical distancing and hygiene protocols. And while those protocols are relatively effective at keeping the number of infections down, Many parts of the world have urban geographies and informal economies that make impl implementing and sustaining them difficult, if not impossible. Moreover, even the regions of the world that are lucky enough to be able to make such protocols work are suffering extraordinary economic hardships as a result. Indeed, nation states around the world are facing the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, as a result of which the UN is predicting almost unfathomable effects on global employment. Now, the point of hashing out all these details is not for the sake of it, but rather because they can help us appreciate a key way in which research ethics is being put to the test. To see how this works, it's helpful to think about the fact that the development of an effective preventative or therapeutic measure might significantly mitigate or even halt the clinical disaster and reduce the economic disaster that we're already facing. Consider, for example, how effective states like China and Taiwan have been using epidemiological tools to identify, track, and respond to outbreaks of COVID-19 in real time. Yet some of the measures that these states use, such as highly invasive phone technologies, comprehensive video surveillance, and the use of security forces to undertake interrogative measures, have been aptly described as draconian. 
At the same time, there are states such as South Korea that have employed much less repugnant contact tracing techniques, such as the use of voluntary phone apps. And this has helped them to realize excellent results as well. But then by contrast, there are states around the world whose citizenry possess deep-seated suspicions about the effect that such techniques are likely to have on their personal privacy. And these worries may be warranted in certain circumstances. But regardless, this raises serious ethical questions about how to strike an appropriate balance between the urgent need for accurate and current epidemiological data with individuals' rights to privacy. Moving on from epidemiological concerns, there's been a more general discussion about the possibility of using innovative types of clinical trials in order to speed the discovery of a vaccine or clinical treatment. In particular, researchers and ethicists have been pondering the use of what they call human challenge studies, where we'd intentionally infect research participants with the SARS-CoV-2 virus as a way of testing the efficacy of new vaccines. And doing this, it's been suggested, may well save us days or even months of time, which would translate into immense human and social benefits. And yet there remain serious ethical questions about what if, excuse me, about exactly if and when it would be acceptable to engage in such seemingly high risk studies, especially because in the case of COVID-19, we'd be infecting people with a disease for which there's currently no cure and whose behavior and effects we do not yet fully understand. On a related front to the use of innovative study designs, there's a question of bypassing standard research and review protocols. And the thought here is that when trying to treat a disease with no known cure, it may be acceptable to provide people with an untested or completely tested treatment, since the alternative is to offer them no treatment at all. With this in mind, a number of state regulatory agencies, including the American FDA, have started to grant what they call emergency youth author authorizations to several different diagnostic tools and therapeutic interventions. And while this strategy can offer the appearance of hope in an otherwise hopeless situation, there's a number of ethical worries associated with it, including things like giving the public a false sense of security, potentially wasting valuable time and resources on therapies that don't work, and in the worst case scenario, allowing insufficiently tested procedures and therapies that are harmful to make its way into our medical systems. As such, we are confronted by the question of whether and when precisely we're justified in bypassing standard research and review protocols, and if we ever are, whether those conditions are met in the current pandemic. A fourth and for our purposes final issue that's raised by the urgent need for a cure has to do with when and where researchers should release the results of their work. Currently, many scientists are sharing their conclusions uh, well before they've undergone full review processes, the sorts of processes that are normally used to assess and validate them. The justification for this behavior is that the faster the researchers share their results, the faster that other researchers can build off their work, and the faster we can find an effective vaccine or a treatment. But what we're seeing is that many recent studies have been undertaken with such haste, or with participant populations that are so small, or with commentaries that are so exaggerated, but they're not actually establishing the conclusions that they purport to. And at the same time, things are compounded because the public is so starved for new information about COVID-19 that these unreliable preprints are being regularly reported by the media and accepted as fact by the public. The problem here, obviously, is that this results in the spread of dangerous misinformation about the nature of the disease at a time when people are especially susceptible to believing anything they read. So the ethical question we're faced with now is how to balance the need for expedited dissemination of research findings against the harm that it can cause. Okay, now, as I've said, the first four issues we're talking about here with regards to COVID, these flow from the extraordinary pressure that researchers are under to eliminate or at least mitigate the effects of COVID-19. There's many other types of research ethics concerns raised by the current pandemic. Consider the following. Although COVID-19 has spread around the globe into members of virtually every community, not all groups of people are equally vulnerable to its effects. So, for example, in high-income countries like Canada, there's growing reason to think that people from lower socioeconomic classes and people from marginalized and historically oppressed groups are experiencing disproportionate infection and mortality rates. 
Yet in some jurisdictions, government research programs have explicitly refrained from disaggregating epidemiological data in ways that would track these dynamics. And this is despite the fact that such data might plausibly be used to develop a better understanding of the disease and hence provide for more efficacious public health responses. Meanwhile, there are additional issues of vulnerability playing out in other parts of the world. Consider, for instance, that many low-income countries don't have health systems that can support the kinds of mass hospitalizations that countries like we have in the global north use when dealing with large COVID-19 outbreaks. Instead, states like South Africa and Uganda are relying on a combination of extreme preventative measures and the eventual procurement of an effective vaccine or treatment to allow them to deal with the impending threat. But here there's a serious worry, which is that in order to ensure that an eventual remedy will be effective around the world, it has to be tested around the world. Yet of the more than 1,000 clinical trials dealing with COVID that are currently registered with the WHO, only eight are currently set to proceed in African nations. So it looks very much like the current pattern of research distribution regarding COVID-19 is leaving a number of categories, excuse me, is leaving a number of countries, especially those that are especially vulnerable to the effects of that disease in the lurch. Now this pattern is a function of a very great many things, including the existence of limited research infrastructures and, underde and underdeveloped regulatory pathways. But this itself, these limitations, like the existence of disproportionate infection and mortality rate amongst marginalized groups, just serves to highlight the existence of pre-existing and very serious inequities. And so it shows us the importance of considering ethical questions about the extent to which research investment, design, and location should be guided by, by concerns for vulnerable populations. Okay, so I've taken us through a lot, and I think that this is probably a good place to wrap things up. Um, let me finish with this slide, just in conclusion. What I'm hoping to have conveyed in this very short presentation uh, is an appreciation of the extraordinarily valuable role that medical research has to play in navigating and resolving outbreaks like the one that we're facing. But I hope I've also conveyed a recognition of some of the ethical pitfalls that can follow from the dramatic sense of urgency that inevitably intends are these situations that we're in. And I also hope I have provided a sense of how these sorts of situations serve to highlight and at their worst even exacerbate pre-existing issues of ethical concern. With all that said, uh, I'm done and I will pass the mic back over to Claudia. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt, um, for that uh, great presentation and uh, sort of highlighting uh, a tremendous, uh, you know, collection of, of issues. Um, so where should we start to untangle this? I mean, there's a few sort of tensions that you've highlighted here, which are uh, not unusual in standard uh, research. Uh, however, they, they certainly seem to be much more pronounced, much more aggravated in the context of a pandemic. And certainly one of the things that I heard you say was around this notion of urgency and uncertainty. A pandemic prompts us to act quickly. Research must be deployed quickly. And this all has to be done in the face of uncertainty. And you had a few slides there around this possibility and in, in fact sometimes this this challenge of where ethics might be sacrificed in in the in the interest of speed or efficiency and so I, I'm actually going to turn this one over to Ross first but we'd be interested to hear what what others uh, might have to say about this but this worry around the need to be to respond with urgency and expediency is there a real risk that we are sacrificing or bypassing ethics protocols? Is the quality of ethics review or ethics reflection actually the sort of thing that we ought to be concerned about in the context of the pandemic? Oh, well, thanks, Claudia. That's a, a great question. And Matthew, thank you for an excellent presentation. I was really struck, if I can just speak for a second, you had that headline that the Salk vaccine and that it works and it was nice to see it and it really did work unlike some of the headlines we've seen in COVID about, about things that may or may not work. Um, so I'll just speak to my experience working with various different uh, groups going back from SARS through to the present. So after and around the time of H1N1, the WHO convened a working group to look at research ethics in emergency contexts. 
And yes, there are some distinct differences, particularly. Uh, and remember that everybody was urgently worried about SARS. H1N1 was, uh, again, a big worry, similar headlines and Ebola. Uh, the scale and spread of COVID is just slightly uh, larger, but the ethical issues actually don't change. So the general arguments that we've given uh, right through all of the uh, guidance documents and including in the COVID-19 outbreak. So I'm currently co-chairing the WHO Ethics Working Group and we had a presentation in February at the R&D Blueprint meeting. That's when all of the researchers came together from therapeutics, vaccines, diagnostics and clinical things. And it was nice to actually stand up in front of the world, in front of all of these August people and say, you know, the ethics community has its uh, house in order. We've done a lot of thinking from Nuremberg to the present about what are the requirements for ethical research and what the headings are and how you do that. We also have the recent experience of Ebola where no shortcuts were taken. And, and so as much as people are desperate to find something and have this you know, unerring belief that science is always right. I think it's really important that we insist upon uh, all research meeting the highest standards. And I was extremely happy that the funders, the NIH, the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, the CIHR, everybody at that meeting said, we expect this research to be carried out according to the highest standards, meeting all of the ethical uh, standards that have been articulated. So it's possible to do it. In 2014, uh, when the West African Ebola outbreak occurred, there were no treatments. Uh, there was the same kind of uh, dismal uh, despair, 70% uh, mortality rate, the specter of thousands and tens of thousands of cases. Uh, and we were able to actually get research protocols designed and approved. And so the uh, Director General called a meeting in August, and by the end of December, people were being enrolled in, in clinical trials that had been through all ethics approvals, uh, at, and also we built up the capacity. So it's gonna take an investment. So that being said, there is an obligation on uh, member states and organizations, and uh, perhaps Jennifer will agree with me on this point, to build capacity so that this uh, research can be done. Uh, the work we did, for example, with MSF was finding ways in which you can rapidly but efficiently and to high standards review uh, protocols. So it takes a little work on both sides. So I would argue very strongly against any corner cutting, any derogation from standards. It's not necessary. We need to protect human subjects that are enrolled in clinical trials, uh, and it's possible to do that. Great. Thanks, Ross. And, um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned this, the work in Ebola, although there was a lot of initially uh, quite a bit of pushback from the community. There were questions, there was always questions uh, from the community, sometimes around the distrust that there is in research and when things are happening, when they're very, when they're very new, uh, when, they're, when there's a lot of uncertainty, as Matt was talking about. And I actually want to turn this uh, question to, to Jennifer, because in your work, you're doing a lot uh, at the African Academy of Sciences around you know, clinical trials, building capacity, and there's a lot of push, particularly on the African continent, to get uh, expedited ethics review, to fast track protocols as we've seen in Ebola. And so Jennifer, I'd like to get a sense from you around, is that worry? Uh, is there a worry that in expediting and in fast tracking and trying to do things that, you know, that there is somehow some risks to the community, to individuals, that we are cutting a little bit uh, a, a corner and uh, the ethics corner. And, you know, I, I say this because I was recently on a call with the African CDC where I heard some, you know, some words from colleagues around that there might be some issues around you know, we want to ensure that there's quality review, even though it's expedited. But get a sense from you, is this a concern, particularly uh, in Africa? Well, thanks, Claudia. Um, and sorry, I'm going to ask you to repeat the last part of your question because there was a, a disturbance there in terms of the, uh, the, the voice, and then I can take it. Sure, so uh, the question is, is there concern um, on the African continent that with the push to fast track clinical trials and to bring COVID-19 clinical trials 
um, into Africa, uh, is there a worry that all of this expediency and speed might cut some corners in terms of ethics and protection of human subjects? Yeah, so thank you very much, Claudia. And um, it's kind of nice that I'm coming after Ross and he's explained very well that a lot of work has been done previously. And a lot of capacity was built, um, for example, after the Ebola uh, outbreak in the Western African region with regard to uh, the way they handled the epidemic at that point. And also the fact that WHO has set up uh, the AVRF a platform, which is the African Vaccine uh, Regulatory Forum, which was set up in 2006 to very specifically look at this issue of um, um, uh, reviews uh, on the capacity of reviewing uh, uh, protocols on the on the continent. But now we are faced with the pandemic, and it typically uh, on the African continent, uh, reviews can take long. They can take you know 60 to 90 days before you actually go through your, the review process. But what's, what's happening at the moment is that, um, you know, an institution like WHO Afro Week uh, is under which AVRF is housed. You have to go back to the drawing board and have conversations around how we can actually expedite those processes without necessarily cutting uh, short or, or having, um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, relaxed guidelines against or so the rules have to remain, uh, the international standards have to remain, but the other um, aspect of the process that we can look at that can then allow for an expedited review. So um, in April, um, the, the steering committee for AVRF sat and they uh, revised the guidelines specifically for this pandemic, where they are going to be able to actually review uh, the, pro the protocols for repurpose drugs with, within 10 days and for completely new drugs uh, or, or therapeutics within 15 days. And while this is yet to be implemented, uh, it gives you a sense that the uh, continent is ready to some extent in terms of being able to actually uh, um, expedite the, the reviews. Uh, and that means that people should not have an excuse to take shortcuts. And and uh, and go ahead and conduct an ethical uh, uh, protocols. So that has been provided. What we are doing in terms of building capacity and working closely with AVRF at the African Academy of Sciences is one to increase the visibility of the work that AVRF is doing. Like you know, just letting sponsors and researchers know that now they can get the proposals uh, revised or, or, or reviewed within uh, a much shorter time. But also reminding them that they have a role to play because sometimes the delay is not necessarily on the regulatory uh, uh, committees themselves. It's when we ask for specific questions and people don't respond on time. So, you know, each, each, each one of us has to play our part so that we can expedite um, like the, the proposals and, and get them uh, to the field as soon as we can. That said, I think there are, the recent past has seen, you know, a um, number of conversations that have you know, had a negative impact in terms of clinical trials being conducted on the continent, which kind of um, then makes it difficult for regulatory um, committee members, you know, they start frowning at all these, you know, um, um, uh, different um, sponsors that are coming onto the continent with, with different pro proposals. But um, the, the, the guidelines provide for um, regional uh, committees to come together, we provide for joint reviews uh, to, to be conducted. And so all this uh, will hopefully um, be a, a, a platform on which we can have expedited reviews. Over and above that, I think in terms of capacity building, as, as Ross was saying, there, is, there are conversations on how we can make this even better. What, for example, what um, online platforms can we improve on what they have um, what inefficiencies are there in these platforms that we can work on really in the next few weeks or in the next month or so as people are, are still thinking about this protocol so that we can again make it even much better. So in short, I would say that um, I, I, there's no need for people to shortcut. There are um, guidelines in place and the regulatory committees through AVRF, for example, have already expedite protocols for different uh, uh, sponsors who, who want to do some work on the continent. 
Great, thanks, Jennifer and Ross. And you know that it, you know it's reassuring to hear that uh, you know at least on the ethics side and in terms of ethics review and ensuring protection for human subjects that there is no need to cut corners and this worry perhaps is overhyped because we're thinking about urgency, speed, uncertainty, and in some ways this is kind of a testament to the preparedness aspect, right? So we, we've gone through several of these. We've learned some lessons. Maybe there's some we haven't learned. We'll circle back to that, Ross, at, a, at another time around lessons learned. But at least it seems to me that one thing that at least we've learned is to, um, is, is, is to be able to conduct ethics review and to pay attention to that dimension of clinical research um, you know, without cutting corners, as you say, Jennifer. Uh, I wanna turn now to, to a, an important point that Matt raised around risk tolerance and what's appropriate for risk. And, and in part, this concern around whether we bypass ethics or we shortcut on the ethics because you know, we have to do things very quickly. There's this other element to it, which is how much risk, you know, there's, is there a greater risk tolerance in the context of a pandemic because people uh, want an intervention. They want, they want prevention, they want treatment, they want a rapid response. As you say, we want to curtail infection, disease, and socioeconomic disruption. And at least on this bit of speed, one of the things that we've heard quite a bit, and, mentioned, and Matt, you mentioned it in your presentation around human challenge studies. So I'll turn it to Seema to give a little bit of an explanation of what exactly a, a, a human challenge study is, but the, the great interest in doing these studies, uh, particularly now for COVID-19, is that they could potentially expedite the development of vaccines. So Seema, I'm gonna turn it over to you to give a little explanation and, uh, and then I invite sort of the panel, you know, tell us, and maybe the panel can weigh in on whether in this interest of urgency, um, is it, can we, should we be infecting people intentionally with, with COVID-19 to get to, to a faster vaccine? Seema? Great, thank you, Claudia. Um, so human challenge studies are studies where people are deliberately exposed to a pathogen in order to either learn about the early stages of disease in a way that you couldn't otherwise, um, or uh, test vaccines or treatments in a very uh, controlled fashion and quickly learn whether or not they work with many fewer people than you would have to do otherwise. They can also do things like identify correlates of protection or ways of telling um, when someone is actually protected against the disease. And what's interesting about human challenge studies is that they have this long history of being conducted, but a much shorter history of ethical analysis about when they're acceptable. Um, so in the past, people have kind of converged around this consensus that you can do these studies when there's an effective treatment that you can give somebody so that you can rescue them from that disease, as is done for malaria human challenge trials where people are infected with drug susceptible malaria and the and given the drug when they show symptoms. Um, or the treatment, the disease itself has to be uh, characterized well enough that it's what people call self-limiting. Um, so the idea is that you can receive supportive treatment and you most likely won't have any long-term consequences. So what's new about considering doing these trials for COVID-19 is that there's a lot we don't know about the novel coronavirus. We um, don't necessarily know why some people who are young and healthy don't have any comorbidities become very sick. And we still don't know what all of the possible complications are, particularly in the long term. So we're just starting to hear about uh, young people being at higher risk of neurological injury and stroke um, or kidney damage, and we'll likely learn more very quickly. In my mind, this question about do we tolerate higher risk is one that all has a lot to do with the uncertainty. So we're trying to figure out, you know, whether challenge study volunteers could be exposed to different kinds of risks, and yet we can't fully characterize what those risks are. Um, in terms of the whether we're shifting in our ethical standards when we start to consider challenge studies, I don't know that that's true. I think for a while now, people have been questioning the consensus that you need a treatment or you need a disease that's self-limiting recognizing that challenge studies can be a valuable tool in the arsenal against emerging infectious diseases. And the question is just how can they be deployed in a way that's ethically acceptable? Um, so in my mind, the principles are the same that we always apply. The principles are that 
the risks have to be identified as well as we can, minimized um, and justified by social value or benefit to the individual. Uh, and in challenge studies, most of the time, there's no benefit to the individual from being exposed. So it's really this question of whether social value is enough to justify those risks. Um, and in the context of a pandemic, what is different is the social value is much higher than it might otherwise be. Um, and it's much clearer in many cases. The big, there's sort of two big questions in my mind about whether challenge studies are a good idea right now for SARS-CoV-2. And the first is whether the social value could actually be realized by a challenge study. So the, the main proposal on the table is that challenge studies could replace field efficacy trials. And instead of testing um, for over the course of a few months whether vaccines work in people who are being naturally exposed, they would be tested in people who are being exposed in a non-natural way. And there are a lot of concerns about generalizability, whether you, we learn enough about whether a vaccine works in a challenge trial to be able to roll it out to a population, um, and concerns about risk to the participants, but also how these things all fit together. Would regulators take these data and actually use them? Um, is it the case that because challenge studies would take a while to start, that by the time they actually were ready to launch, vaccine trials would be speeding ahead? Um, so those are that's one big question. And the second big question is the question about risk to participants. And I think until we have better answers on those questions, it makes sense to lay the groundwork for challenge studies given all of their potential, but not to try, not to say we're green lighting them for sure, to be able to make that judgment call later when they're actually ready to be launched. Thanks, Seema. And can, if I can just follow up um, on this issue of then, you know, the risk, and I mean, obviously, so, you know, you know, as, an, as a person working in the space, I appreciate the justification and the value, the social value that could be obtained, you know, from, from uh, human challenge studies. As just an ordinary citizen, I'm thinking, wow, that sounds, you know, it's so crazy. We're all, you know, four and a half billion people are under lockdown trying to avoid infection. And then here we are um, now proposing to take a select group of people and to purposely infect them so that we can develop this vaccine. So it seems, you know, part of that is just the risk, right? So we're trying to avoid this risk of infection. And one of the things I wanted to, to ask you about is in the 2015, 2016 report, when this, during the Zika outbreak, you chaired the panel at the NIH that ultimately came to a conclusion um, that found that doing a Zika challenge at that point during the outbreak was just too risky. What's different between the Zika outbreak and our current COVID-19 pandemic that seems to suggest that we might be open to doing, and certainly there is a lot of interest um, in a human challenge study for COVID. Uh, in fact, we have this One Day Sooner, this organization that I know you're studying, where there is now about over 20, perhaps 25,000 uh, volunteers from 102 countries who are willing to come forward and said, I'm willing to be infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 to develop a vaccine faster. So in short, what's different between the Zika outbreak and our current outbreak that would, you know, balance out? This mm -hmm. Great question. So I, one of the big differences here is this question of third, what we called at the time um, in the Zika outbreak, third party risk. So the question of whether you could actually protect people outside of the study who did not give their consent to be exposed to the disease. Um, at the time when we were reviewing the ethics of the Zika virus challenge trial, it was the guidance was that you had, you were, it could be true that you could transmit the virus for six months after being infected. Um, so precautions would have to be taken for that long. And it wasn't clear to us how researchers could actually come up with a plan where participants would refrain from behaviors that could infect others, including sexual activity, or at least taking precautions for six months to ensure that the virus wouldn't be spread into the community. Um, so that was one big concern that we had. The second concern was about the social value, which is related to the current concern um, that I have with some of the proposals for COVID-19. Um, but the concern was that when we spoke to the US FDA at the time, they did not indicate that 
they were open to the possibility of a Zika virus challenge study, that, the, that its use was something they were skeptical about. And the FDA also cited the fact that within their regulations, they get to make ethical judgments as well. Um, and the ethics of the Zika virus human challenge trial at that time concerned them. So returning to the case at hand, um, with COVID-19, it seems like we, we know a little bit more about how to prevent the spread of the virus. And it seems that if you were to confine participants in a research facility for three weeks, most people would agree that you wouldn't risk transmitting it to others outside of the research. We also have a sense of what protective equipment research uh, personnel should be using to make sure they don't become infected. So the third party risks are less concerning um, and seem manageable in this case. But I do think the social value question, this question of whether the challenge study itself will move the needle and in what way is a big question that still needs to be answered here. And the last thing I'll say about uh, the Zika virus experience is I think there has been a lot of movement and lessons learned since that experience. Um, so that prompted me to try and work with others to develop guidance on this issue in an ethical framework so that we weren't, we as an ethics com uh, community weren't caught flat footed with, I think we had three or four articles about challenge studies at the time. Um, so we've been trying to answer these hard questions and research ethics that all come up at the same time in the context of challenge studies and spent time trying to get better answers to those since the epidemic. Um, additionally, what's happened with Zika virus is that the incidence of Zika virus has gone down and field trials ultimately were not possible to complete, but people don't think that the threat has gone away. Um, so this issue of using a challenge study for intra-epidemic periods is something that's a really important possibility to keep in mind, which may have relevance for the current pandemic as well. Great, thank you very much, Seema. I, I wanna pick up on a question from one of the audience members. Thank you very much for the question. It's around something, Matt, that you mentioned in your slides around collaboration. So I'm gonna ask you to comment, and then I'm gonna ask Ross to comment. So the audience member has astutely um, pointed out that this is a very interdisciplinary panel. And uh, the question is, could we better paint a picture of how interdisciplinary approaches sort of come together? So the, the philosophy, uh, the ethical components. Um, so how is it that the professionals in these very interdisciplinary sort of areas come together, sort of make their way through these ethics issues? Maybe Matt, you wanna comment on something and then Ross, um, who has interdisciplinary expertise across a number of areas, would love to hear your thoughts on that. So I guess I'll start by saying, let's treat this as an ethics issue, right? So the question is, how does interdisciplinarity come into ethics? I mean, one of the obvious answers is this. Ethics is about the world. We're trying to figure out the right way to behave in this world that we live in. And that mandates that we have a very clear understanding of the world as it is. And to get a very clear understanding about the world, you need to understand it from a bunch of different perspectives. That involves very technical scientific views, social science views, historical views, cultural views history of oppression, you name it. You really need to have a lot of people on the table giving you all the information that's relevant, these highly sensitive moral considerations. Just take something like trying to figure out what sort of contact tracing you should do in a given country. You can have an abstract view about how contract tracing should work in some kind of you know, abstract world. But when you're thinking about it in the context of a place like, compare South Korea to the United States. And think about the differences between societal attitudes, between efficacy, between phone use, between trust in the government. You have to know all that stuff before you ever get to the point where you're identifying relevant ethical principles and then applying them. And then even when you're at that point, you need to remember that your perspective on the ethical issue is only one person's perspective and that it's informed by your history and by your perspective. And so you need to bring in other people from other communities with their perspectives and their take on the ethical issue as well. So ethics done well is always interdisciplinary, right? full stop. So I'll, I'll hold off at that point before I keep going. Thanks, Matt. Ross, how do professionals work together? Like, how do you bring this interdisciplinary help? How, how has your experience been? I mean, you were at that R&D blueprint yeah. uh, meeting and many these sort of meetings. 
so there's there's two kind of different ways I would approach this project or the question. Uh, one is in your own work and in your own research to create those trans inter meta chooser prefix prefix disciplinary teams. So when we had a large grant, for example, studying ethical issues in, uh, in you know for pandemic preparedness back in the aughts, um, I deliberately created a team with as many diverse points of view as possible. And it takes a little while to get people to work together. And then over time, and it's it's actually a lot of fun because we had some, you know, critical social theorists who were all informed by Foucault and everything was problematic. And we had some very heavy duty, positive uh, scientists who said, you know, books, why would you write a book? The only reason to have a book is to hold open a door. Everything had to be quantitative. And it took us about uh, three months to find uh, our way to work with each other to understand each other's language and then cohere uh, and then that actually was a, a very successful uh, project and we're all still colleagues and friends to this day so for research projects you can actually foster and design uh, and create and build and nurture interdisciplinary environments when you get to the global stage, however, uh, you know, something like the R&D blueprint, you really do have to fight hard to push for interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. Everybody gets very much uh, slotted in. So even though I'm an epidemiologist, I'm on the ethics committee. So I'm kind of a stranger at the bedside on the clinical trials working group, even though I've done RCTs and understand epidemiology. They're always looking at me going, well, like, you're the ethics guy. Why are you asking these questions? Um, so I think actually I would put this back on academia and say that we have to do a much better job of uh, uh, breaking down silos and how we train people. So people like to follow their uh, own disciplinary patterns and become very expert in, uh, you know, not just the virus, but uh, RNA stranded viruses and not just RNA stranded viruses, but the third strand of the seven strands of RNA viruses. And then you kind of find a coterie of people around the world who have your same obsessions and you don't ever get pulled out of that. Uh, but as uh, Matt very clearly showed, and as I've argued for a long time, if we're going to get our head around pandemics, it's truly pandemic in the sense of all things that relate to humans. And I think the one beautiful thing about ethics is it actually draws that all together because we're going to treat people fairly. If you're going to uh, show respect for individuals and communities, you need the social sciences. If we're going to solve the uh, medical and biomedical problems, we're going to need to inform people who are working in positive bioscience how they're in, the work that they're doing is going to integrate into social cultural uh, perspectives. And then there's the kind of nice con contribution uh, that philosophy brings, which is for you know, rigorous concern for clarity of concepts and rigorous uh, argumentation and critical thinking. So uh, it's going to be a longer haul to get the global research world into an interdisciplinary uh, environment. But I think there's ample opportunity, and I think your program at McMaster is a great example of how you can draw very diverse uh, disciplines together. And Claudia, your own work, I know, working with uh, various different people in various different uh, aspects of global health and global science. Uh, if, you work with, if you work with people long enough, they'll start to understand the ethics. <laughs> That's the other thing. It's just sheer persistence and doggedness. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. So you, you, if you, you just wake people out. That's great, Ross. Uh, the next question, I'm going to turn over to Jennifer, but I actually would invite the other members of the panel to weigh in because I think this is one which I think we all grapple with. We've got COVID TV 24-7, this constant bombardment of information. Uh, but the, the, the question from the audience is around fake news. So um, what can be done to combat the number of misleading information regarding COVID-19 when there are important organizations like the World Health Organization are being cast as the main culprit in these conspiracy theories? And so I'm thinking here, Jennifer, about some of the rumor spreading, things that happens during the context of an epidemic um, which we saw in Ebola. So what can we do to combat the fake news that spreads inevitably, probably faster? So the only thing spreading faster than COVID is probably rumors. What can we do about that? 
Okay. Thanks for that question. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, you know, for example, all the news that has been out there and some of the comments that have been made have led to a negative uh, you know, wave across the African continent, for example, with, with regard to uh, both COVID-19 uh, therapeutics and clinical trials, as an example. Um, I think it goes back to um, having the right kind of relationships with the communities and the people that we work with. And somehow going back to what, we, what, what uh, uh, we've just discussed in terms of collaboration, if people have the right kind of relationships and trust with, with government, with uh, researchers, with uh, um, local leadership, they then can, can uh, be confident on whom to go to for the right kind of information. I don't know how we can have, you know, like the you know, information that goes around on WhatsApp and everything, but at least if people know that there's a certain um, uh, place or platform that they trust or individuals that they trust that they can go to for the right kind of information, they're probably going to seek that. But the challenge we have with COVID-19 is that we are locked down in our homes. There is no possibility of, more of me walking down the street to talk to somebody else to find out what's happening. So then how do we educate our communities when they are already in their own homes and receiving these messages on their, on their platforms? So one of, one of the, some of the guidelines that we've put out um, in, in a, a document that was drafted by a data and biospecimen committee for the African Academy of Sciences is around, you know, uh, communities and governments investing in, in, in doing videos that are, are informative, that have the right information, and if people see these videos are coming from their government, then uh, 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 hoping they trust their government, then they can pay attention to that. The ministries to be uh, taking a lead in this, developing um, WhatsApp kind of groups that are managed in, in a specific way, but also just providing platforms where uh, communities and people from the community can ask questions to professionals uh, and, and get the right kind of answers. Otherwise, I think we, we, I, when I look at it, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm like, we live in such a, uh, we are living in such a difficult time, but also the very things that we hope to help us, you know, move forward quickly are the same, uh, is the same technology, for example, that sometimes in a very sh short, uh, uh, you know, time or in just the blink of an eye, something spreads so quickly and trying to change that negative thing into a positive becomes quite a challenge. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, let me wait and hear what the, uh, the other panel say, because this is quite um, a challenge and um, I'm, I'm here to learn too. Who wants to weigh in on this next? Matt? Sure, I'll take a turn. Um, so I think in many ways, this is partly a question of social psychology. So it's just one of those situations where I wish we had an even bigger conversation going than we do. Um, but there's been some kind of initial speculation on, on how this sort of a situation might arise um, and how it might be deal with. And, and this is all kind of very new literature, some of it in the popular media, some of it in preprints. Um, and one of the speculations is that what we're dealing with here when we're dealing with misinformation is just the representation of a lack of trust in populations, in their governments, in health institutions, and in a variety of other, uh, uh, let's call them agents. Um, and so I think one of the questions that we have to deal with, and sorry, to, to kind of bolster that suggestion is the thought that if you look around uh, to different jurisdictions, you'll see that there seems to be kind of this issue of mistrust and of misbelief and of, of kind of promoting falsehoods seems to be concentrated uh, amongst people who feel dispossessed or um, unstable in their relationship, especially with their health care provider, but even more so with their government. And so one of the things that, that has been suggested that I, I take as a kind of good initial thought is, you know, one of the things we need to do is for the countries that are willing to work very hard to behave in ways that, um, are good for the people who are mistrusting you. Show them through your actions, if they won't believe your words, that you are actually looking out for them and that you, you are someone to be trusted. I and mean, I take it that that might be one of the kind of crux things that we have to consider. The kind of lousy part of that suggestion is that takes time. 
that takes time and you're trying to penetrate a group in many who in some cases, especially for some of the hardened cases, are going to be initially and maybe deeply um, unresponsive. And so I, I take it that this is not something we're gonna be able to turn over in a few weeks or a few months, and probably not during the time of this pandemic, unless, again, we can really convince them that we are people who are worth trusting, who are worth listening to, because we have their best interests at heart. So I'd like to weigh in as well. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately in the context of challenge trials with the long history of doing challenge trials on vulnerable populations or without their consent. And I do think, you know, one solution or one suggestion people have made is to, to build on something Jennifer was saying that if you've already laid the groundwork for trust within a particular community, that might be the best place to start in doing a more controversial type of trial. So it is recognizing that trust is something you earn over a period of time and therefore if you've done that hard work and invested that you can build on it now um, and that's a really interesting um, we had a journal club recently we read an article by Laura Becker Sullivan which was about uh, trust and distrust in clinical encounters and she had a couple of really interesting points one was that you know, sometimes we think of communities lacking trust as a fault of that community. So that, that community is, you know, failing to recognize what could be beneficial to them and they are doing something wrong. And, then, you know, physicians just have to figure out how to work around this problem. And one point she made is that communities can have, you know, or people can have healthy skepticism of institutions that have failed them in the past and that that can make a lot of sense in some situations. So, you know, to think of it as something where the patient or the community has to do the work is sometimes just wrong. Um, and the second point she made, which I thought was really interesting and could apply here, uh, is that sometimes it may be that there needs to be an acknowledgement of this lack of trust. And uh, in this case, she was talking about medical professionals sort of taking the risk of acknowledging the elephant in the room. Instead of trying to just paper over this idea that patients don't trust them and, and may not agree with what they're going to do or may not comply with the recommendations, they should actually acknowledge it and talk about it and explain that they, um, they recognize it and they want to address it and they do care about this patient. And I wonder if in some of our communication, acknowledging the fact that, you know, although research ethics today looks very different than it did 20, 30 years ago, or certainly 100 years ago, um, we still have a long way to go. And we're still figuring out some of these ethical issues so that there is this effort where researchers have to make, um, take it upon themselves to be worthy of the public's trust. And I don't know exactly how to cash that out or exactly what it would mean, but I do think there's something, an interesting idea there that we could build on. Yeah, so just uh, join in and agree. So trust is the sort of uh, meta principle. Uh, we identified it after SARS as being uh, incredibly important. We devoted a lot of our time when we were doing work in H1N1 to analyzing and figuring out trust. So if you look at the philosophical literature on trust, you know, Annette Byers very uh, sort of seminal work on trust and antitrust. She wrote a lovely 48 page dense analysis of the concept of trust between one and one relationships and came to the conclusion that it's a very difficult and uh, complex question. Uh, when you move up to the level of social trust, it becomes even more complex. So I've been arguing for over a decade that we need to take the concept of trust and trustment, building, sustaining, and maintaining trust as a very serious ethical uh, undertaking of organizations and institutions and public health. Um, and that work needs to be done through community engagement, which we're still trying to figure out as uh, Jennifer and Claudia know, we don't know what the best way to do that is. And that's a little bit of a buffer against misinformation. But I think we have to be mindful of the fact that there are people out there with the interest uh, for uh, uh, you know, explicitly uh, and intentionally uh, sowing misinformation for other ulterior political motives. 
And so the one thing that I think was different about COVID from all the other outbreaks is the role of social media and how it's being used as a channel for misinformation. And it's very unclear whose interests are being served. And I'm really, unfortunately, uh, not of the opinion that research ethics can do a whole lot to stop those malign intentions. Uh, but I think that's something that civil society groups, uh, I know the WHO is very concerned about the infodemic because it actually harms people. And so where we can find people who are deliberately, willfully, intentionally misleading people and finding ways to sort of close off those information channels is really important. I'll give you an example from SARS. So there were people who were peddling false cures. And let's be honest, there is not a very well-resourced public health agency anywhere in the world. And so if you have to take your precious resources and try to find out where these rogue actors are and try to put them out of business, you're taking time and resources away from the contact racing, the field epidemiology, and the research work that you want to do. So this is a really super important issue that we have to get our heads around in the future. Thanks, Ross. Um, so perfect segue. You mentioned just in your comments now around uh, trust and engagement. So I think we all recognize the importance of trust. And there is a question from an audience member uh, around how do, do researchers during a pandemic where there might not be necessary time to build relationships of trust, engage with communities who distrust clinical research in order to conduct important and timely research. And, you know, this question of engagement during the pandemic is one that, um, you know, came up a lot during our World Health Organization or WHO panel on human challenge studies with the group inherently divided. Well, it's critically important, but how do we do it? So, you know, how do we do engagement during a pandemic um, to try to build those relationships, relationships of trust? Who wants to take this one first? So I think, I think Ebola is a great example. Um, so, uh, social scientists uh, started to work with uh, communities, so anthropologists, sociologists, ethnographers. Uh, started, you, you have to legitimately be concerned and interested in the community, and you need to find uh, vehicles within the community. It's an imperfect art right now. As you know, there's a lot of concern and interest in how you do uh, community engagement properly. But if we didn't do, uh, so I will say that the Ebola outbreak was turned around uh, by, I would say, effective community engagement that was mediated through uh, very skilled and gifted uh, ethnographers, social scientists, working with where you could find trusted community leaders. And that means you need to have people in the community you're working with because you can't just drop in and parachute in and uh, do the community engagement in a short period of time. Uh, that's why it needs to be a continuous process with researchers. They need to take it seriously. Uh, they need to be trained. Uh, we need to continue research and build capacity in that regard, because otherwise a lot of science will absolutely fail. And our colleague Jerome Singh has written uh, quite a bit about uh, failure of community engagement and paralleling uh, very highly resourced uh, studies. So if you've invested a lot in a research study, but you didn't re invest in community engagement, then you've squandered a large amount of money and time and experience and uh, expertise. Does anyone else want to comment on engagement during a pandemic? Okay. Um, I have a, a question from an audience member, which is interesting uh, in the sense that it raises other sort of important issues. So we're talking about ethics and um, one of the things, of course, for ethics is to sort of balance um, priorities. So there's the uh, balancing priorities in terms of resource allocation, both in terms of time, you know, where do we dedicate our attention? And one of the, the interesting things that comes up is um, how we're diverting so much attention and resources to COVID because it's the immediate thing. And yet there are other pressing problems, uh, you know, persist, right? And I mean, you know, so HIV, TB, malaria, these things, still all continue. So the, the audience member asks, can the panel, panel discuss some of the ethical issues associated with the disparity between the mass mobilization of the global medical community in trying to develop a vaccine for COVID-19 and a historical refusal to mobilize this scale to solve other very pressing medical issues? 
So it's just the scope of the pandemic enough to divert all this attention and resources to this versus all of the other pressing things that are going on. Who wants to take this one? Matt. So it, it starts with ethics, so I'll take a shot at it. Um, so, I mean, one of the values that you're hearing a lot all of a sudden, it's been around before, um, but maybe it doesn't get as much play in research ethics as it has in the last three months, is this notion of solidarity. And one way of thinking about solidarity is this, is that it's to identify, right, um, with other people as, as though you're all a part of the same entity. You're all, a, you share agency. You, you think about them like you'd think about your arm. And one suggestion that's been floating around is that, is that listen, the psychology of this disease, right, it has spread to virtually every region of every country on the planet. And I think that may be a first outside of the flu. Um, the psychology of this breeds a kind of interconnectedness and a kind of shared sense of plight that we may never have seen before in recent history. Um, and so one of the thoughts is that it's that kind of unity of purpose, that sense of, of shared being in it together, um, right? and being subject to these concerns ourselves is exactly what's kind of motivated um, a special drive to come together to resolve this. Um, that, that's one thought. This again is a little bit of psychologizing about exactly why we're behaving this way, um, which I'm not a professional on, um, but I think there's something there. Seema? So, um, I, you know, it's interesting living in the United States. I mean, there, there are people who really do feel the solidarity and it's very visible and certainly others who don't um, and are not affected by the t pandemic in this way and who think that we're, we're sort of overreacting to what's happening. And whenever I address questions like these, I struggle with, you know, how do, how do you not feed those who aren't taking this seriously enough? I think that's one important um, caveat to anything I'm about to say. But what I do think is sometimes in an emergency, we also have a hard time thinking clearly. And it's something that worries me a little bit about these calls that we started with about, you know, taking shortcuts in the context of an emergency. There is a difference between emergency mode and um, you know, the normal mode that we operate in. And I do think in some ways the decisions we've made about this pandemic, we haven't in the United States seen really strong leadership to make decisions about things in a clearly rational way, except in, in a certain pockets, certain parts of the government or certain states. Um, and in many ways, I think people are sort of flying a little bit blind and not really clear on what to do in the absence of guidance. Um, so in some ways, I think there's this, at least in my country, a bit of a failure of um, rigorous, rational decision making that could start to weigh different kinds of um, goods that matter and figure out how you balance the need to treat people for certain conditions against uh, the need to fight the pandemic. And a lot of decisions are being made in, you know, ad hoc ways or at various institutions in ways that, that may not make that much sense. Um, I think I saw the questioner mention, you know, this issue of family members not being able to be there for loved ones. And that's certainly been something that a lot of people have been really troubled by um, and something that some institutions are starting to figure out um, and come up with better protocols for how to make sure that family members can be there to say goodbye or to, you know, have iPads donated or the various ways that institutions are becoming more creative. But I think that's something that we haven't paid enough attention to. And I, I think some of it is just, you know, it's difficult to make rational decisions in an emergency. It's not, it's again, it kind of goes against human nature. Um, but hopefully that is something that we learn from this pandemic as well. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, so I, I just want to comment and say that um, I totally understand where this question is coming from. We are, uh, you know, also asking the same question sometimes. But for me, I think it's lessons learned. And, and I'm hoping that specifically for African government, for example, that there's a lesson here to learn. And that beyond COVID-19, African government will actually be proactive 
in the biomedical field, in the research and development field, and you know, for example, investing the right amount of, 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 of money that we need for us to do the research that we need to do and to invest in, in the innovation pipeline around research and development. Um, we do know that this will impact on, you know, you know, for example, the HIV, uh, um, uh, people living with HIV that are probably not receiving their drugs right now. But the lessons are bigger than, than that, that uh, uh, epidemics do happen. And sometimes, you know, countries have to fight on their own. And so can African government take research and development seriously and invest in that area going forward. So I was just going to add, I think there are specific dimensions to respiratory virus epidemics because they spread rapidly. Uh, people become sick quickly and the death emerges relatively rapidly. Uh, it is currently pandemic, maybe in five, ten years. Uh, we won't take it quite so seriously because uh, we'll have uh, some proportion of the population immune. Uh, there will be a Definite. So Jennifer mentioned HIV treatments being interrupted. We know that shutdowns in places where there's high prevalence of an incidence of tuberculosis, you're just going to get more TB. Uh, vaccine programs have been interrupted. You saw a similar uh, shift in, in, in the Ebola outbreak in 2014, where maternal care, measles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it just goes to show that uh, uh, viral pathogens and pandemics pose very, very significant challenges to human societies. There isn't actually a health system on earth that can withstand a fully explosive uh, COVID outbreak as we've seen, uh, China, New York City, and Italy. Uh, so it would be irresponsible not to put all of our resources to try to stop this, but it means on the other side of the coin, it's like the crowded closet problem. You know, you get all the shelves up here uh, sorted out, but then you look down and it's all kind of fallen down there. And then when you try to clean that up, the top falls down. Uh, human life is messy and tragic sometimes. And this is making, uh, forcing very difficult decisions between uh, competing goods treating your tuberculosis or stopping a uh, pandemic, given the urgency and speed with which people die and the general uh, lack of immunity in the population. I don't think there's any other choice but to try to do our best to bring this to some sort of a halt and then sort of deal with the consequences of it after, which means that people who are involved in public health and health studies will not be out of business anytime soon. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Ross and the speakers. Uh, I have a, so there's several questions. We have actually a lot of questions around uh, the human uh, challenge studies. And then there's some, sp some specific questions directed to members of our panel. Um, Seema, I'm going to direct this one at you. It says, what would you say to someone who insisted that conducting a challenge study for COVID-19 treats individuals as a means to an end? And that even if participants provide informed consent and want to participate, we should not be infecting individuals with a pathogen that we know very little about and it will make people sick. So this question of instrumentalism. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, you know, Kant famously said that people shouldn't be treated as mere means to an end, recognizing that in research, research participants serve an important intermediary role. And the question is, I think, I think what's at the core of this question is how do you treat people with respect? Um, even as they're in that role. And I think there are a couple of interesting opportunities in this moment. Um, so Claudia mentioned the rise of this group called One Day Sooner, where there are about 25,000 volunteers who've signed up to join a hypothetical challenge study for COVID-19 because there isn't one yet for them to join. Um, and we're, I'm working with others to try and figure out what do these people who signed up, who are they? What do they understand about these potential studies? Um, you know, what is it that they, what are their motivations? What do they think they're getting into it for? Um, in the past, I've tried to understand volunteer motivations in malaria challenge trials. And it's been interesting to see that, you know, participants will say that there are moments where they feel, um, they have this this moment where they realize you know they're having a cup of mosquitoes placed on their arm and uh they do feel like they are sort of instrumental in something bigger than themselves 
Um, but in these trials, what was interesting is that the connections between the participants and the study staff were really important. The feeling that all of their questions were answered, that they were treated with respect throughout, that if they had any symptoms or they had any concerns, those were taken really seriously. Um, that made a really big difference to them and how they felt about being involved in those studies. Um, so I think that there is this opportunity to recognize that we can go beyond even the basic respect that participants should be shown in ordinary trials and do more here in this moment if the challenge study actually does move forward, which, you know, as I said, I'm so skeptical at the moment that it, it will um, have enough social value or that the risk will be low enough to proceed. And, and I think we need to know more to know for sure if the challenge study could do that. But assuming that it could, um, that then I think, you know, in the past, we've treated research participants as people who are somewhat faceless unless something bad happens to them. So research participants are, who are famous are people who died in research for the most part, with maybe the notable exception of the Berlin patient. Um, and I think what is interesting here is that in other cases where people um, give to society and go into the unknown, um, you know, astronauts, for instance, we treat people as um, contributing something really valuable to society that gives them higher status and that gives them our respect. And I think it could be a really interesting opportunity in this moment to say research participants who understand what they're getting into, who are volunteering uh, because they want to contribute, are people who are similarly worthy of respect um, and should be treated accordingly. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question that says it's for all panelists, but in particular for Jennifer. And it's a question that, uh, interestingly enough, draws on the kinds of therapeutics that we might be considering. So one of the things that we've been talking a lot, quite a bit during now the COVID-19 response is the use of convalescent plasma. We heard about this as well in, in terms of the Ebola outbreak. And so this is the, the plasma taken from those who have been infected, have been recovered, have antibodies, and we use that and give it to others uh, to confer protection. And of course, this raises all sorts of uh, issues sensitively around, um, you know, blood um, and specimens. And in particular, there was some hesitancy in, uh, in Africa around the use of convalescent plasma. And so the question is this, um, in the West, when we think of developing uh, therapeutics for COVID-19, we tend to think in terms of Western science and medicine. So I'm wondering whether there is a role for traditional or indigenous ways of knowing to inform and aid us in developing therapeutics for COVID-19. So an epistemology kind of spin to that there. So Jennifer, why don't you start? And then I'd love to hear um, what uh, the other panelists have to say about other ways of knowing in terms of uh, coming to uh, alternative therapeutics. And obviously an important question given how much vaccine hesitancy uh, there is right now and what we can anticipate once we actually have a vaccine if we get one. Jennifer? Yeah, um, thank you very much. So that's a very interesting question. Um, there's definitely room for that. So about maybe a month ago, uh, the African Academy of Sciences actually held a webinar where they were um, hosting uh, research scientists from across the continent and we asked them the question, what are the research priorities that you want to be seen uh, uh, conducting across the continent over and above what WHO and Globida have put together as priorities? And it, it, it was very interesting, some of the things that came out. And out of all the, the responses that we had, there were a number of them that were very specific to, um, after, you know, that one new to the list that WHO has already put out of there. And, and, and study of indigenous, um, uh, um, you know, uh, medication or treatment was one of them. So definitely it's, it's something that African, African uh, uh, look at uh, with, with high, with high uh, acceptance. It would be something that would be promoted. And I think if, even within the African Academy of Sciences, there are different um, uh, provisions even for some of the programs that we run where we, uh, we, we do give research to people that are using, you know, doing um, a herbal kind of research, for example, against certain diseases. So it's, 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 an, it's something that is accepted and I think 
if there are the right, if we have the right guidelines, it should be allowed for, for research to be conducted in those areas because um, we, we do know that in, in some, um, um, you know, in other areas that it, it works. It just needs to have the right guidelines so that people know exactly what they're doing. In relation to COVID-19 though, um, I know that there's a, a drug, uh, a rather herbal medication that is being promoted by um, the president of Madagascar, Mozambique, I forget now, but one of the two. And um, the challenge with that is that I don't think a trial has been conducted on it. So we, whether it that a uh, herbal drug, because we don't know what the active ingredient is, we don't know what other side effects it could have. And um, in this particular one, it's, it's, it's one that is also uh, used for treatment for malaria. So we don't know what the um, interactions are going to be when, when people do that and, and, and if it's an, within an area of high mal malaria um, um, incidence. So I think if the proper research is done, with these indigenous um, uh, treatments, it should be given an, uh, a chance uh, uh, in the research world for COVID-19. Thanks, Jennifer. Does anyone else want to want to comment on this question? I'll just point out that there are several trials in China registered with uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. I guess the, to me, the question fundamentally becomes the design of the trial um, and uh, whether you've got well-defined uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria and a meaningful outcome measure. Um, and in the way that the current core protocol for, for example, the uh, solidarity trial at the WHO, in a platform randomized trial, you can put anything in a treatment arm and you're going to have predefined ideas about whether it's working or not because you've agreed on what the uh, measures of uh, response are. And I think at this stage, as there's uh, some plausible reason to believe that it might be effective, then there's no reason why it can't be an arm in a platform randomized trial. Great. Thanks very much. So we're just coming up on the hour and uh, I want to thank everyone, all our panelists for uh, the fantastic discussion. I want to thank the audience members for your participation and, and the questions. I'm sorry we're, we weren't able to take all your questions, um, but uh, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity for follow up. And I, I want to thank the Socrates Project for organizing. In the last two minutes, I just want to close. Uh, actually, Ross, you were, you were the last person speaking, so I'm going to give you sort of the final word on this in your veteran career of dealing with these outbreaks. Um, here we are, we're maybe at the halfway point, maybe not, and I think an important, we started with lessons. Um, have we learned any lessons and are there new lessons to be learned from this? Ross, uh, Well, as you know, I've been skeptical about our capacity to learn lessons having uh, written a paper where I argued that the only lesson we learn is that we don't like to learn lessons. This time, I think, what's the word that people use? We should be woke. <laughs> I mean, if we're not aware now of, of all of the ways in which a viral pen, and there's worse out there. I mean, I'd like to say that uh, with confidence that this is the worst possible viral epidemic, but we were actually planning for worse. So now everybody, there's just nobody on the planet who can't possibly have any understanding of what this could potentially mean. So if we don't learn our lessons this time, I don't know what it takes. Uh, we'd be a completely incorrigible species. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, what those lessons are, I think we're still going to be itemizing them. Uh, but uh, if we don't learn it this time, I don't know when we're going to. Great. And with that, thanks everyone once again, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.